Hi folks, so today we're going to look at a paper by Dijkstra. This came out in 1965 and it basically kicked off the entire field of distributed computing. It looks at the solution to the famous mutual exclusion problem in distributed computing. Like any good story, this paper has three parts, the problem, the solution, and the proof. So let's look at each of those. So here's the problem. We have n computers, and these are more like processes. These are not computers as we currently understand them. These are like processes within a single physical computer. And each of them is looping infinitely. They're cyclic. And each of them has a critical section. And the property we want to enforce is that at any given time, only one of these processes is executing its critical section. This is the mutual exclusion problem. Now, whenever we try to implement some kind of mutual exclusion, we have to assume that the underlying hardware gives us some primitive to build this on top of. Most modern chips have things like compare and exchange or test and set, which let you build mutual exclusion. For the purposes of this problem though, Dijkstra is only assuming that reading and writing words from memory is atomic. What that means is if two processes are trying to write exactly the same word in memory at the same time, they will get serialized. Same thing for reading. We want our solution to satisfy the following properties. We cannot assume any priority among the end processes, so they must all be treated equally. We cannot assume that they all run at the same speed or make any assumption about their speeds at all. And then we have a couple of liveness properties, which ensure that the system as a whole makes progress. The first one says that if a process is outside its critical section, it cannot block any of the other processes. And the second liveness property says that if one or more processes are about to enter their critical sections, then at least one of them is able to enter the critical section. This is like when two people are at a door and they keep saying after you, no after you, no after you, and then no one goes through the door. We don't want that to happen. Okay, so here is Dijkstra's solution. He assumes that there are three items that all the processes share in common memory. Two Boolean arrays B and C, each of length n, where n is the number of processes, and an integer k. k is going to vary between one and n. The way the solution is set up, B of i and C of i are only ever written by the ith computer. They can be read by all the processes, but they're written only by the ith process. The initial value of k doesn't matter, but we start by assuming that the Boolean arrays b and c are all set to true. Here is the heart of the paper. This is the solution. It's a very short piece of code, but it takes a lot of unpacking. So let's look at this a little bit closer. So this is a really hard to follow piece of code. The variable names b and c are not very helpful in understanding what's happening here. There's a bunch of go-tos. There's a go-to here going back to line one. There's another go-to here also going back to line one. And this is the go-to which makes this whole piece of code an infinite loop. Now here is the critical section and that's the piece we want to make mutually exclusive. Now let's try to see what is happening here and if we can make this code a little bit more understandable. First, let's see what's happening to the B array. When is B of I false? When is it true? Right at the beginning, we set B of I to be false. And then it stays false throughout. We never write to B of I, except right after the end of the critical section, when we say B of I is equal to true. And then we go back to the beginning and b of i is false again. So we can see that b of i is kind of a marker for wanting to get into the critical section. Since we know that only the ith process is writing to b of i, we know that b of i is false when we are in the critical section. Now let's look at c. This piece of code 
is basically checking that my C, my C of I for this process is false and that everyone else's C of I is true. And only if that condition holds, we enter the critical section. So C of I is a marker for being in the critical section. Now let's see if we can rename some of these variables and try to make this piece of code a little bit more understandable. I'm gonna make two changes. I'm gonna rename B to want to be in critical section and I'm gonna rename C to be in critical section. And I'm gonna flip the booleans. I'm gonna assume that they all start out false initially. All right, so this is the version of the code with some variables renamed and the meanings of the booleans flipped. And let's see if this is a little bit easier to understand. We still have the go-tos. This one goes back here. We have another go-to, this goes back here. And this is the go-to which makes this whole process an infinite loop. First, let's try to convince ourselves that the critical section is indeed mutually exclusive. You can see that the only way you'll get into this critical section is if in critical section of i is true. And then in this loop, we're checking that everyone else's in critical section is false because if it is true, then we go all the way to the beginning. So if anyone else is in their critical section, we go and jump to the beginning. So the only way you could have come into the critical section is if in critical section of I, that is my flag is true and it's false for everyone else. So mutual exclusion works with this piece of code. Now, the next thing we want to prove is liveness. We want to prove that if multiple processes are trying to enter their critical section, at least one must succeed. All right, so let's see what Dijkstra is saying about liveness. If the kth computer is not among the looping ones, so B of K, so B was want to be in critical section, will be false, right? So we set that to false over here all the ones that are looping will find k not equal to i. And because, of, and because of that, one of them will satisfy this condition and it will then assign k to be i. And once k is assigned the value i, and once k is assigned the value i, b of k becomes true. So this becomes true for the kth element when this k is assigned the value of i. And this means no other processes can select a new value for k. So what happens then is k will point to one of the looping processes and then will not change its value until the critical section is done. And what we walked through was this explanation by Dijkstra for liveness. Now I have to say this is really hard to follow and it's even hard to explain. This is one of those things where you have to just look at this code for a while, let it bounce around in your head to really understand it. So that was the paper that laid out the first solution to the mutual exclusion problem. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time.